Greetings and salutations everyone, my name is Andrew Kirkoff and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today we're talking about my week 4 running back rankings for the 2021 fantasy football season. On today's episode we're talking about all things related to the running back position beginning with matchups. We'll talk about which defenses thus far this season have given up the most points to opposing running backs whether it is on the ground or through the air, giving you guys some perspective as to who has the most advantageous or perhaps the most disadvantageous matchups going into week 4 and how that is going to potentially impact their overall upside on the week then after that we'll talk about my top 36 running back rankings as i'll give you guys my perspective and of course statistics that justify the reasoning as to why i go ahead and rank the running backs as such and how i think the running back position is going to stack up when all things are said and done in week four now before we begin today's video i want to continue to thank you guys for the incredible support for of course coming out every single day with your viewership smashing the like button commenting down below and of course subscribing for those of you who have not yet already i cannot express enough just how important it is to subscribe to the channel because we're making fantasy football content for the entirety of the 2021 season and beyond of course this is a fantasy football channel and that's what we're going to be talking about whether it is rankings waiver wire pickups rest of seasons you know overall rankings strength of schedule videos hidden gems all of the above sunday morning live streams from 8 a.m to 10 a.m pacific standard time making sure that your lineups are ready to go in order to win the given week but of course to help you capture a 2021 fantasy football championship by the end of the year because that is our goal so make sure you subscribe to the channel help us continue to get through our goals again our next big goal is 60,000 subscribers help me get there thank you very much all right before we begin, for those of you who are interested, we have timestamps down in the description of the video. I want to go ahead and remind everybody as well that these rankings are for a half PPR scoring format, meeting everyone in the middle, whether you do play in a standard or a full PPR. Outside of that, let's get into talking about the running back position. Do not forget, rankings are always subject to change because if in fact an injury and or more relevant news is revealed to us as the week progresses, there are going to be players with the amount of injuries we've of course seen thus far this season that are going to be in and out of lineups and even before, five minutes before a game, deemed inactive. We'll keep an eye on that, but of course, let's get into the running back position beginning with matchups. So as you can see to the left of me, these are stats that I've continued to show you guys week in and week out for the 2021 fantasy football season because I think it's extremely vital to understand how many points defenses are giving up to opposing positions, specifically the running back position. On the very left, we have 2021 running back fantasy points allowed. As it currently stands, the Seattle Seahawks have given up the most points to opposing running backs thus far this season, followed by the Jets. Chiefs, Dolphins, Jaguars, Lions. Are any of us surprised with that specific outcome? Not really. Prior to the season even starting, right? The strength of schedule video that I posted at the running back position mainly had those teams integrated with, of course, giving a lot of points to the opposing running backs because they have done it year in and year out. So it shouldn't be a surprise. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, we have the teams that have given up the fewest amount of points to opposing running backs. The Carolina Panthers, they have had a very favorable schedule. I know in week two they played against Alvin Kamara, but that new New Orleans Saints team wasn't at their full capacity, and it was obvious by the way that they play. But either way, they have been incredible. They've given up the fewest yards per carry on average thus far this season. I think it's like 2.19 yards per carry to opposing running backs. They've been incredible in terms of stopping the run. The Denver Broncos have been great. The Cleveland Browns are a surprise team there. I know that they went ahead and they addressed their defensive position by bringing in free agents, rookies, and of course continuing to build players within their own organization that they drafted in later rounds throughout the years but man they have looked incredible in terms of stopping the run the Steelers of course are always in this conversation Bills Saints the Dallas Cowboys have been great but a lot of teams haven't run the ball on the Dallas Cowboys thus far this season I think they have the fewest rushing attempts against them um, or are in that conversation with the Carolina Panthers so a lot of teams don't really run it on the Cowboys so we haven't really seen much there but if you can see to the right of the statistics that I was referring to, we have the 2021 running back rushing stats allowed. This gives you some perspective as to which teams are giving up the most points to running backs on the ground via rushing attempts and touchdowns. As we can see, the Miami Dolphins over the last couple weeks have been continuously exposed, which is obviously going to be huge for Jonathan Taylor this upcoming week. I know Nelson, their left guard, is dealing with a high ankle sprain, is most likely going to be out. They obviously have a lot of offensive line instability at this current moment in time, but this is a week for Jonathan Taylor to have a breakout game, and I think it's probably going to be a pretty exciting one. But either way, the Miami Dolphins, Seattle Seahawks, Kansas City Chiefs, Los Angeles Chargers, Jacksonville Jaguars, these are teams that are giving up a lot of points on the ground. And the reason I isolate specifically rushing yards in comparison to isolating receiving targets mainly has to do with if your offense and the scheme that the offense pretty much runs on a weekly basis entails running backs running out a lot of routes and targeting them 
consistently, then we'll see those numbers regardless of what defense we play against. Again, I did an entire breakdown of that this summer. Uh, so if you do want to go ahead and kind of get some more context as of that, uh, you can go to the running back strength of schedule video that I posted uh, during August. But either way, I isolate these numbers, showing you guys the matchups and who has the most advantageous ones at that going into week four. Let's go ahead. And now that we've covered this, Let's get back into the top 36 running back rankings. I will be referring back to the statistics that I've gone ahead and just shown you guys. Uh, but either way, we're, we're there. If you want to go back and pause that, you can certainly go ahead and do so as I break that down every single week. Don't forget, half PPR, timestamps down below. Rankings are subject to change. Thank you, guys. Don't forget as well, hit the like button if you like today's content. And of course, subscribe to the channel. I really do appreciate you guys very so much. All right, let's get into this, shall we? Starting off with our week four rankings, we have King Henry as our number one. Derrick Henry has been absolutely incredible. And obviously his overall productivity thus far this season has earned him the number one overall running back spot as it currently stands, regardless of scoring format. Standard, half PPR, full PPR. He has been an incredible monster. Now, obviously this upcoming week, he has the second easiest strength of schedule matchup against the New York Jets. I mean, the New York Jets in the last two weeks have given up four rushing touchdowns. Uh, this last week, Melvin Gordon and Javante Williams took advantage of them. The week prior, it was, of course, James White and Damian Harris. The New York Jets defense and the New York Jets organization as a whole has been struggling mightily. We know Derrick Henry's a monster. I mean, he's coming off of another week in which he had over 100 rushing yards. Um, thus far this season, he has 12 total receptions. His career high in a specific season was last season in 2020, in which he had 19 total receptions. He is almost... In within maybe the first month of the season going to eclipse his overall receiving you know career high number which is unbelievable to me hopefully they continue to get him more work with aj brown being out but either way no doubt about it king henry's our number one in a great matchup we have alvin kamara as our number two you know it was good to see that the new orleans saints weren't going to continue the trend of what they produced in week two against the carolina panthers they looked abysmal and it mainly had to do with the fact that a lot of their coaches were out um, of that game obviously on the protocol so if in fact we go ahead insert those coaches back into the conversation you know Sean Payton has a huge coaching tree I think he's got about 25 coaches over there <laughs> with the New Orleans Saints so obviously all of those guys make a huge difference on a weekly basis it was obviously apparent this last week against Bill Belichick um, you know <laughs> the the New Orleans Saints could do no wrong whether it was offensively or defensively now with all being said Alvin Kamar had himself a pretty good game 24 rushing attempts again we talk about opportunity being king in the National Football League 24 attempts three total receptions got himself a receiving touchdown on a nice choice route in which obviously he was wide open because the linebacker jumped in the wrong direction but regardless of that we're talking about Alvin Kamara he's an automatic start every single given week plays against the New York Giants the eighth easiest matchup the running back position just recently uh, on the ground running backs have succeeded against the New York Giants but specifically through the air uh, I went and found that J.D. McKissick, 83 rushing yards in that Thursday night contest. And uh, we had Cordero Patterson this past week, 82 receiving yards against that defense. So we have two backs that have gotten a lot of success in the receiving game with five or more receptions. Hopefully we can see more contributions from Alvin Kamara in that perspective of the game. Hopefully he can get himself some more targets going forward. Austin Eckler, speaking of getting targets, Eckler has been incredible thus far this season. He is currently in a half PPR scoring format, the number five overall running back. And the reason because of that is because he has been awesome. I mean, besides the fact that he's scoring touchdowns, the receiving work is consistently getting there. In the last two weeks, he has had 15 receptions within this offense in a full PPR that continues to rise his overall stock. But in a half PPR, we're going to take that every single given week. Now, this upcoming week takes on the Las Vegas Raiders. Based on what we were able to see from the Los Angeles Chargers, going to the Kansas City Chiefs and getting a monster victory away from home, that's huge. Playing against the Las Vegas Raiders, another divisional matchup. They're very comfortable with one another. And when we look at what the Las Vegas Raiders gave up to the Miami Dolphins this past week, 20 total rushing attempts for 96 yards and a touchdown to the combination of Malcolm Brown and Miles Gaskin. Uh, as of thus far this season, the Las Vegas Raiders have given up a touchdown to a running back in every single game. Hopefully, Austin Eckler is going to continue his trend, continue to get himself a lot of work in the passing game. I mean, the Raiders have looked really good, and this could potentially become a shootout. And if, in fact, it's going to be the case, we're going to see a lot more work from uh, Austin Eckler in the receiving game, which continues to grow his upside and his potential on a given week. That is why he's our number three. Moving on to Nick Chubb, our number four. Nick Chubb, yes, 
he, he didn't score a touchdown and it was a little bit of an underwhelming game because all of his statistics just came from his 84 rushing yards, 8.4 fantasy points. Yes, that's unfortunate, but ultimately when we think about Nick Chubb and what he's capable of doing, if in fact Kareem Hunt doesn't take that juicy 29 yard you know rushing touchdown, maybe you know Nick Chubb doesn't score that, but eventually Nick Chubb is going to get his touchdowns. We know that for a fact. It's not even a big deal. This upcoming week's matchup against the Minnesota Vikings, in my opinion, is an advantageous one, especially considering we have Kevin Stefanski, the current head coach of the Cleveland Browns. He was the former offensive coordinator of the Minnesota Vikings in 2019. They're going to have a little bit of a revenge game. I don't know if it's technically revenge, but he plays his former team. It should be exciting for the organization. Thus far this season, the Minnesota Vikings, uh, they've given up the 15 most points two opposing running backs uh week one joe mixon had himself an incredible game 127 rushing yards and a touchdown chris carson this past week prior to of course the injury and then coming back from the injury and fighting through that 80 rushing yards and a rushing touchdown i think nick chubb cream hunt either of them are going to succeed but we of course are seeing nick chubb get a lot of carries i mean 22 this last week he gets himself a sprinkle of a couple targets here and there his overall upside continues to grow dalvin cook is our number five now you may be wondering why i have dalvin cook here it is relatively early in the week. Again, we're recording this video on Tuesday morning. So if in fact Dalvin Cook is going to play this upcoming week, I'm going to start him and I'm going to put him as my number five overall running back just out of the pure respect of Dalvin Cook as a player. I mean, we know what he's capable of every single given week, whether it is on the ground through the air. He is the entire offense and they predicate their entire offense on, of course, running the ball, then hitting defenders with play action and being able to let Kirk Cousins carve him up accordingly. Now, Dalvin Cook may not play this upcoming week. But with that said, I want to go ahead and talk about Dalvin Cook and Alexander Madison in the same breath because he's currently dealing with a high ankle sprain. Typically, if you're dealing with a high ankle sprain, the chances for you coming back, if in fact it is not as severe, maybe two weeks you miss, maybe three weeks, worst case scenario, and then you'll be fine. But if it's more of a severe situation, which I don't think it's going to be considering Mike Zimmer all of last week was pretty much giving us the indication that he could have even played last week if in fact they needed him. They went ahead, they did this, you know, the wise thing, they let Alexander Madison cook. And Alexander Madison did exactly that. 26 carries, 112 yards, six receptions on eight targets, 59 yards, and a total of 20.1 fantasy points for Alexander Madison. An incredible performance all in all. With this all being said, if Dalvin Cook plays, I'm starting him. He may be limited to a capacity and maybe we'll see more Alexander Madison than we typically do, but that's just going to be something we have to keep an eye on as the week progresses. Now, in terms of Alexander Madison, if Dalvin Cook is out, I think Alexander Madison has proven and will continue to prove that he is a top 15 back nonetheless. This last week, I had him as my number 11 as we did our Sunday morning live stream. He obviously produced even better than that with 20 fantasy points in a half PPR scoring format. So, And that was even including not scoring a touchdown. So we'll keep an eye on the entire situation as it unfolds throughout the week, the practice reps, whether or not Dalvin Cook's going, and we'll keep it as such. Uh, but either way, we'll have our updated rankings as the week progresses by Sunday morning, giving you guys a little bit more perspective. But either way, just wanted to talk about both these running backs in specific. Moving on to Joe Mixon as our number six. Joe Mixon is the thumbnail for a reason. He gets a short week and gets to play against the Jacksonville Jaguars on Thursday night. Jacksonville's giving up the fifth most points to opposing running backs. Thus far this season, they have just been slaughtered on the ground. Obviously, this last week, James Conner went for two rushing touchdowns, 43 yards. We had a couple sprinkles of Chase Edmonds on the ground and even through the air. I think he got himself about six receptions. Uh, even going back to week one against Houston, the Houston backfield on the ground had 120 rushing yards and a total of three touchdowns between Ingram, Lindsey, and David Johnson. The Jacksonville Jaguars looked a little bit more competitive this last week, but ultimately it's not going to matter. When we're talking about a running back like Joe Mixon, who has been given ample opportunity week in and week out, he is going to be able to find success. I'm just hoping it's going to be a higher scoring uh, Thursday night game, one of those shootouts. But, you know, the, the amount of productivity we found from Joe Mixon just this last week against the Steelers of all teams, 18 rushing attempts for 90 yards, we will take that. And though it didn't really come with a touchdown or anything of that nature, it just gives me more confidence in starting him regardless of the matchup. But considering it's an advantageous one, we are absolutely firing him up for this week. Ezekiel Elliott is our number seven. Now, Zeke had an incredible game last night on Monday Night Football. I mean, 17 carries, 95 yards, two touchdowns, three catches on three targets, 21 yards, 25.1 fantasy points, finishes the number one overall running back in a half PPR in week three. With that said, this is back-to-back -back weeks of Ezekiel Elliott getting over 18 total touches, over 97 all-purpose yards, and at least one touchdown in that contest in the back-to-back -back weeks. So, is Zeke getting his job taken from Tony Pollard? No. 
But obviously, Tony Pollard is going to get himself more and more work, and he's going to in- integrate himself in this offense as we see it. And, you know, we've continued to see as the games have gone by, there are going to be drives in which Zeke is out there, and then the next drive, it's going to be Pollard. And then the next drive, it's going to be both of them combined uh, with one another. But we know that Zeke is a better pass blocking back. He will dominate the receiving work going forward. I can assure you that. But as of this current moment in time, they trust him more. That is why he is, of course, mauling defenders, dipping his shoulder, and finding a lot of success thus far. The issue is, it is the toughest matchup on the year, according to just statistics. But sometimes when we look at statistics, we got to take into account what they've played against. The Carolina Panthers haven't really had much competition thus far. The Jets, a underhanded and, you know, disadvantageous uh, Saints team without much of a coaching staff, and then Houston. All three of those teams, in my opinion, um, in the given weeks that they played them, didn't really have a chance. And I think this Dallas Cowboys offensive line, as they've proven already thus far this season, especially in the last two weeks, they are ready to come downhill and just maul defenders, and they're going to find a lot of success in doing so. Uh, I think Zeke is a great play, and that is why we have him seven. We have Jonathan Taylor as our number eight. Uh, we talked about last week, players to go after in trades. And I talked about Jonathan Taylor as the first running back I wanted to go after. I think this last week, him only getting 7.7 fantasy points, but averaging 6.4 yards per carry gives us every possible reason to go after him. Guys, Jonathan Taylor is probably at an all-time low in terms of his overall value. Please go and trade for him because this upcoming week, the Miami Dolphins game, is going to be his breakout game of the season, and he's finally going to get back on track. The Miami Dolphins have given up the fourth most points to opposing running backs. In the last three weeks, Damian Harris went for 100 yards on the ground against them. The Buffalo duo of Singletary and Zach Moss went for 108 on the ground and three rushing touchdowns. Peyton Barber, of all running backs, had a career high in fantasy points and rushing yards, 111 and a touchdown. My gosh, Jonathan Taylor should be running over this defense and running to the house and scoring a lot of points. He, he is primed and poised for a breakout performance. I think this is the week in which he does so. Aaron Jones is their number nine. Now listen, Aaron Jones... Out of the pure respect of him, maybe even should be higher. But regardless, he's an automatic start. So where I put him in this top 12 is, is kind of irrelevant. But just giving you guys my thoughts right now. The Pittsburgh defense is a strong one. Now, they have given up yardage on the ground to opposing running backs this season. Singletary Week 1 had 70, 72 total rushing yards on 11 carries. Joe Mixon had himself 90 rushing yards and 18 total carries. With this all being said, the question is, what is you know Aaron Jones capable of? When you look at Pittsburgh, they've given up the, what, the third fewest points to opposing running backs thus far this season. That is not a great number. But what I want to go ahead and specifically highlight is, of course, the fact that Aaron Jones is a touchdown machine. And though the Pittsburgh Steelers have not given up many touchdowns, if any, touchdowns to opposing running backs this season, I don't think they've given up a single one. I'm trying to think of it. I don't think they have. So with that being said, without giving a touchdown to a single uh, uh, running back against them thus far this season, Aaron Jones may not be in the most advantageous position. But with that said, the Pittsburgh Steelers offense looks terrible. Their defense is beaten up. They don't really have their pieces all together. And Aaron Jones is a touchdown king. In the last 40 games that Aaron Jones has played, and he is not left because of an injury early in the first half, um, he has scored 43 touchdowns in the last 40 games. What do I expect Aaron Jones to do? Score touchdowns this week. That is to say the very least. And of course, continue to rack up yards because he's a great running back, and despite all the complications of that offensive line, continues to find a lot of success. DeAndre Swift's on number 10. You want to know what's insane to me? DeAndre Swift is the number three overall running back in fantasy and a half PPR, tied with Christian McCaffrey in terms of total points. Let's say McCaffrey was healthy. He'd still be the number four overall running back in fantasy right now. He's coming off a week in which he had 20.2 fantasy points, a rushing touchdown, seven catches for 60 yards, 47 rushing yards on 14 attempts. He has been incredible this season. Obviously, in week two was a little bit less of an overall prospect. He still got himself a lot of work in the passing game, and that's all we want to see. In fact, thus far this season, he has 19 receptions out of the backfield. And in comparison to all running backs, that's number two. Who leads ahead of him? Well, it's the gentleman that we're going to talk about next. But regardless of this, DeAndre Swift is an automatic play every single week from here on out. Playing against the Chicago Bears, they've given up the 16th most points to opposing running backs. Pretty much the middle of the pack. Uh, And obviously, with the contributions of uh, Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb this last week, it kind of does skew it in the favor of running backs. But we always have to be worried about Jamal Williams coming and taking a touchdown. You know, a little bit of work being lost in that kind of a region. But ultimately, the success that he has found, in my opinion, 
is just going to purely continue to be the entire functionality of this Detroit offense. We've talked about it. You know, Anthony Lynn uses running backs and only does. And there's a reason why Eckler and Melvin Gordon could coexist with the Los Angeles Chargers years back. And there's a reason why Swift and, of course, Jamal Williams will coexist and both be incredible backs going forward. Regardless, Chicago in the last couple weeks, 70 yards and a touchdown to Daryl Henderson, 69 total rushing yards to Mixon. And, of course, we talked about, um, you know, Nick Chubb going for 84 rushing yards on the ground, Kareem Hunt had six receptions for 74 receiving yards. That bodes well for the potential of a receiving back like DeAndre Swift going into this upcoming week. Now, speaking of the running back that is currently holding the most receptions of all running backs thus far this season, it is Najee Harris. Najee Harris is coming off a week in which he had 19 total targets. The, the stat that I saw on Twitter, specifically from JJ Zachariason, uh, was that since 1992, there has been one running back that has led all running backs in the statistic of most targets in a single game. That was 2018 Alvin Kamara. Now, this is the second highest amount of targets that we have seen to date, and it is an unbelievable number. 19 targets leading to 14 receptions, 102 receiving yards. Not often do you see running backs run for 100 on the ground, much less receiving yards. An unbelievable number. With this all said, Najee Harris has still got an offensive line that is battered, He's got a quarterback that looks like he needs to retire. His offensive receiving pieces, you know, obviously besides him, Deontay Johnson dealing with injury. We got a rib injury with Juju. You know, uh, Chase Claypool's trying to just keep it together as best as he possibly can. This offense does not look good. And with that being said, if they're going to have to continue to feed him the ball because Big Ben doesn't have the arm or doesn't have the ability to sit in the pocket any longer because the offensive line is falling apart, this bodes pretty well for Najee Harris going forward. I think the matchup can be advantageous at times, but based on the Pittsburgh Steelers offense, it doesn't give me much hope that he can get much done on the ground. Through the air is where he's going to have to succeed going forward, and I trust him in doing so. Antonio Gibson's on number 12 for this upcoming week. I mean, coming off a game in which he had 16.9 fantasy points, but he had one reception for 73 yards and a touchdown. So in one play, he was able to get, what, a 13.8 point fantasy point swing in his overall production because outside of that, throughout the rest of the game, really couldn't find much success. 12 rushes for 31 rushing yards. Now, I understand you may be worried about Antonio Gibson. If you want to go sell him, go sell him. I don't want to hear any complaints about him. I think Antonio Gibson is going to find his stride, especially on the ground. The last couple, you know, couple matchups, haven't gone in his favor. The fumbling issues have been something, but I think he'll be perfectly fine against the Atlanta Falcons that have given up the 13th most points to, you know, running backs. I mean, let's talk about Saquon Barkley. Went for 18, almost 19 fantasy points this last week. I mean, Saquon Barkley, the guy that literally couldn't run a couple weeks ago, is now completely tearing up this defense. I mean, if we go back a couple weeks in week one, the Philadelphia backfield combined for 111 rushing yards and a rushing touchdown. I think Atlanta can very easily be exposed. And this offensive line for the Washington football team is very talented. They just have to get into game script. And when they're not having to pass as heavily and have to come back in games, I think Gibson will be an advantageous position this upcoming week in the matchup and play well. Let's go ahead and move on to the RB2 category, talking about number 13 through 24, beginning with Clyde Edwards-Alaire. Oh my God, Clyde Edwards, he lives. He exists still. Oh my God, we're excited. I mean, listen, we knew that Clyde Edwards was eventually going to get out of his funk. These really talented running backs that really haven't shown much this season will eventually find their stride. And that is just something to just keep in mind. Don't overreact. And yes, Clyde Edwards probably lost you two weeks in week one and two, but you have to just continue to go through it with your investment. A guy like Clyde Edwards getting himself 19 total touches in week three is incredible. 17 on the ground for 100 yards. Got himself two total receptions and nine receiving yards and a receiving touchdown. Awesome. We obviously want to see more work in the receiving game with Josh Gordon coming in to the Kansas City Chiefs. It is going to potentially reduce the amount of targets going in his direction, but at least we have seen success thus far this season from him. And, it, you know, there's a pulse there. Now, he plays against Philadelphia. We saw Zeke and Pollard pretty much run through that defense for a total of 150 rushing yards. Philadelphia Eagles defense at times is good against the run, but when we're talking about an offense that is dedicated to running the ball, hopefully, which will be the case for the Kansas City Chiefs going forward, um, I think you know Clyde Edwards could very easily assimilate himself into a position in which he's getting the ball 15, 16 plus times on the ground per game, a couple you know receptions here and there, and just consistent value with the upside of a touchdown. Hopefully that continues going into week four.
We have Chris Carson as our number 14. Now, originally I had Chris Carson a little bit higher uh, prior to a couple of the things that I've heard. Now, when I went back and I watched a little bit of the film of the Seattle Seahawks games, I, I was sitting there and I was thinking, why is Alex Collins in the game so much? And why is Travis Homer in the game so much? I go look at the snap counts and I think Chris Carson only played 23 snaps on Sunday against the Minnesota Vikings in a contest in which they were winning at halftime. And they were pretty much in a position to just run out the clock in the second half until, of course, Minnesota kind of came back on them. That's the second game this season where Seattle pretty much allowed a team to come back on them in the second half and pretty much blown a lead. With that said, Chris Carson, hopefully, is not going to be too banged up this upcoming week. He did return to the game uh, from the, I think it was a little bit of a hamstring injury from what I could tell. But... I think as of this current moment in time, 12 carries for 80 yards and a rushing touchdown, had a nice 30-yard rushing touchdown against that uh, Minnesota Vikings defense, plays against San Francisco, giving up the seventh most points to opposing running backs this season. As long as he's healthy, we're good. But I don't know if he's fully healthy, and I think we're going to see a lot of other running backs rotate until he is fully ready to go. Keep an eye on that. As the week progresses, rankings are subject to change, so we never know. We might end up moving him back forward if, in fact, he is full participant in practice. Moving on to the next running back, we have David Montgomery. Now... I think about David Montgomery, what he was able to do last week. Okay, 6.5 fantasy points is putrid. Terrible numbers. We don't like to see that. But they did play against the Cleveland Browns. And it was another performance from Justin Fields that was very underwhelming. Uh, I think the average or the stat that I heard was that the Cleveland Browns um, subjected the, the Bears to averaging only one yard per play on Sunday. I mean, that's that's horrible. Especially when David Montgomery is not a bad running back at all. and could very easily get himself a great game and a great scheme going but you know Matt Nagy is making a lot of mistakes I, anyway I'm not here to just go ahead and pick apart the the scheme and the choices that they're making over there for uh, the Chicago Bears I want to talk about what we're going to do in the future and what David Montgomery could potentially see this upcoming week now we all know the Detroit Lions give up a lot of points to running backs and for somehow some reason the Baltimore Ravens decide you know what we're going to pass the ball 70 percent of the time of our total offensive snaps against the Detroit Lions of all defense. We're going to test them. And we're going to have, you know, Lamar Jackson go 16 for 31 passing. We're going to have Marquise Brown drop two touchdowns. Anyway, the whole point is, despite all of the issues with Tyson Williams last week, I'm not worried about it. I think Detroit's not that good of a run-stopping defense. I am 100% in on David Montgomery. The last time I saw David Montgomery play against the Detroit Lions last season, 17 carries, 72 yards, two rushing touchdowns, four catches for 39 yards. The ball is going to be in his hand. In order to get this offense going, regardless of who's that quarterback, you have to consistently run the ball. They gave up nine sacks last week. I think they're going to get back to running the ball, regardless of who's at, you know, under center. David Montgomery is a stud. We saw very little usage of Damian Williams. In fact, didn't touch the ball this last week. Good to see. Hopefully, David Montgomery gets back on track and, you know, starts producing for our fantasy lineups. Moving on to Peyton Barber as our number 16. We talked about him yesterday in the waiver wire edition. If you want to hear more thoughts in regards to what I think about Josh Jacobs going forward, I, I don't know if Jacobs is coming back. Dealing with an ankle injury, dealing with the toe injury, the, the turf toe, and Peyton Barber's coming off of an incredible week. But as of this current moment in time, they play against the Los Angeles Chargers, giving up the ninth most points to opposing running backs. In fact, in the first three games of this season, Antonio Gibson, 90 rushing yards against them. The Dallas Cowboys duo of Zeke and Pollard, 180 rushing yards and two rushing touchdowns. And of course, the duo of Clyde edwards alaire and Daryl Williams combined for 128 yards. And of course, uh, Clyde Edwards got himself a receiving touchdown. But either way, the running back position has found a lot of success against the Los Angeles Chargers. And I don't think that's going to stop this upcoming week. Peyton Barber, I mean, running the ball how many times did he run the ball? He had himself 23 rushing attempts for 111 rushing yards and one rushing touchdown. And on top of it, five targets, three receptions, 31 yards. When Kenyon Drake is supposed to be the receiving uh, back and doesn't have a fluid role in this offense, or at least a solidified role, he has more of a fluid role, excuse me. It just makes me think that whoever you know is really the starting back, which is going to be Peyton Barber until Josh Jacobs comes back, is going to be a pretty good option going forward. We have James Robinson as our number 17 my goodness, signs of life from James Robinson. It's good to see you. Welcome to 2021. Glad that you're here and, you know, hopefully going to stay for a little while. You get a Thursday night matchup against the Cincinnati Bengals. This is the best I've seen the Cincinnati defense play in terms of stopping the run in maybe the last four or five years since I've been here on YouTube making content. Uh, they have been incredible. And I don't know what we're going to potentially see this upcoming Thursday. It is a short week and hopefully we get a little bit of a Thursday night shootout, hopefully. Either way, James Robinson was finally given ample opportunity. And to be honest, the Jaguars offensive line actually is playing well. When I went back and I watched the film, they're opening up holes for this guy. They're down blocking the tight end positions, getting 
as much as they could possibly get. They just traded for Dan Arnold, who's going to come in, and he's going to serve as another one of these blocking threats. But either way, 15 carries, 88 yards, and a rushing touchdown. The most important stat, in my opinion, going forward. Six targets, six receptions, 46 yards. That is going to continue to increase his baseline of value this coming upcoming week against Cincy. I think we're going to get a little bit of a shootout, and James Robinson is certainly going to benefit from that. Cream Hunt is our number 18. Cream Hunt's coming off of a week of which he had the most efficiency that I've seen it from a running back in quite some time. I mean, maybe we can go back to some Jamal Charles games in which he was, you know, running the ball for like 12 yards per carry. But I mean, a game in which Cream Hunt had himself 10 total rushing attempts for 81 rushing yards, 8.1 yards per carry, a rushing touchdown, of course, but six receptions for 74 receiving yards. Over 10 yards per touch is unbelievable. And the fact that he had 24 fantasy points, what was he, the number two overall back this week in half PPR? My goodness. Plays against Minnesota. We've talked about it. Mixing this season, 127-1 and one on the ground against them. Carson this last week uh, even left the game, was dealing with an injury, 80 rushing yards and a touchdown. He was hyper-efficient. I think the running back position against Minnesota is going to find success, and it's not going to exclude Kareem Hunt, as he is becoming more and more of a receiving threat in this option, considering Jarvis Landry's absence and, of course, the lack of a number two receiving option in this offense. Pretty much is continuing to lend Kareem Hunt a lot of opportunity, which is awesome for us in fantasy. We move on to Miles Sanders. Now, you may be worried. Oh my God, Miles Sanders is an absolute dumpster fire situation. What am I supposed to do with him? He had seven points last night in fantasy football against the Dallas Cowboys. The issue was he had two rushing attempts for 27 yards. Two rushing attempts for the entirety of that game. It is embarrassing as a play caller, whatever Nick Sirianni wants to go over ahead and do over there. I, I don't know what they want to do, but I understand the reason why they passed as much as they did. Their starting left tackle was out. Their starting right guard is on injured reserve. And their starting left guard during the game was injured. Now, I understand that was late in the game. They're dealing with offensive line issues. Maybe they're afraid of running the ball. But the fact that they didn't run the ball until 7 minutes and 10 seconds in the left in the second quarter is embarrassing by all metrics. I don't care what anybody says. That is unbelievable. They were avoiding running the ball like they were avoiding the plague. Like it, it should not exist in a reality in 2021 in which you're not running the ball until you know halfway through the second quarter. Hopefully, they've realized their mistakes. And when you play against Kansas City, who as of this current moment in time are giving up the third most points to opposing uh, running backs, and on top of it, are giving up some of the most yards on the ground to opposing running backs, it's an incredible matchup. Get back to running the ball. I know the, the offensive line's beat up, but Miles Sanders is a very talented back, and he needs the opportunity to continue to thrive throughout the rest of the season. Moving on to our number 20, we have Chuba Hubbard. Hubbard is in a very good position. He plays against Dallas. I know the Dallas Cowboys haven't given up many points to opposing running backs. In fact, the 27th, 26th most to opposing running backs. Obviously, a lot of teams haven't run the ball against the Dallas Cowboys based on the fact that we just talked about Miles Sanders only having two rushing attempts last night and seven fantasy points. With this all said, when Hubbard came into the game, found a lot of success. After McCaffrey had gone down with an injury, he had 10 total rushing attempts, uh, got himself five targets, three receptions, 27 yards. Great. We love that. The ability to be a multi-purpose back, to be dynamic, whether it is on the ground or through the air, and the fact that we've seen another running back like Mike Davis last season come in and find a lot of success in the absence of Christian McCaffrey gives me enough confidence that whoever's going to be in this backfield is going to be a top 24 talent regardless of the matchup because the opportunity is going to be there. And like we talk about it, opportunity is king and leads to success in fantasy football. I think Hubbard is in a very advantageous position. This is a team that wants to run the ball, has found a lot of success in doing so, and I don't think they're stopping anytime soon. He's going to get his targets. He was a great player, and there's a reason why they drafted him. They knew that was something that they may have to face in 2021, and I'm glad that Hubbard's there to pick up the scraps and, of course, deliver some key fantasy performances. Make sure you pick him up off waivers. We're moving on to Chase Edmonds. I know Chase Edmonds didn't get much work on the ground. 11 attempts for 26 yards. I mean, those are just not the greatest overall attempts against Jacksonville, but the receiving game, 7 receptions, 49 yards, 11 fantasy points. We'll take that. It was mainly a matter of game script that kind of got... Uh, the receiving work for Chase Edmonds, because again, let's not forget, at halftime, the Cardinals were, were down. And at the beginning of the third quarter, we went and saw, of course, the Jacksonville Jaguars go down the field and score. I think they were up, what was it, like 19-7, to 19-10. to 10. They were up a pretty good amount of points. And then eventually, the game script went back to giving uh, James Conner the ball, running the clock out. And that's where, of course, Chase Edmonds was faded out of the contest. Now, with this said, they play against the Rams. And what, in my opinion, is probably going to happen is this is going to probably be a shootout. And if it's anything similar to, of course, the shootout between the Tampa Bay Buccaneers 
and the Los Angeles Rams, specifically in the fact that the Rams may be ahead for majority of that game, then similar to Giovanni Bernard from this last week, Chase Edmonds should see a lot of work. Giovanni Bernard from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers late in that game, nine catches, 51 yards, and a receiving touchdown on 10 total targets. Maybe Chase Edmonds, similar to this last week, of course, eight targets, seven receptions, 49, can get a lot of work in the PPR game, get himself a lot of baseline value on top of whatever he gets on the ground. We move on to Melvin Gordon the third playing against the Baltimore Ravens, another home game. Again, when you go up to Mile High City, I mean, Denver is a tough place to play in, especially for a defense like the Baltimore Ravens, who have been struggling, dealing with a lot of injuries, player on the, you know, players on the protocol, on the injured reserve. It is tough. But regardless, slowly but surely, Melvin Gordon has kind of separated himself from Javante Williams in my eyes. 18 total rushing attempts course continues to expand the amount of touches in comparison got himself 61 rushing yards a rushing touchdown one catch for 21 yards 14.7 points i am glad to see that melvin gordon is continuing to produce regardless of of course 12 to 15 touches per game going into you know the the lap of a javante williams this upcoming week they take on the baltimore ravens giving up the 10th most points to opposing running backs i think the baltimore ravens as of the last couple weeks have been subject to a couple you know difficult matchups and of course throughout the passing game have struggled in terms of stopping of course this last week swift and jamal williams but it's a matter of game script we'll see how this goes i think the, the denver broncos are typically a team that wants to get their running backs involved as much as they possibly can that is what their entire offensive line is predicated on just you know pounding the rock and hopefully they'll continue to succeed melvin gordon's going to get the majority of the touches here hopefully leads to him getting in the end zone as well moving on to our number 23 we have trey sermon now the reason why i have him here is because i don't know if elijah mitchell is going to play i truly don't but Regardless of who plays and who's the starting running back here, whether it is Mitchell or Sermon, uh, I think we could see some split touches or we could see Elijah Mitchell return and be the full starting running back, in which that case would be, you know, a top 15 running back in my eyes, potentially for this upcoming week, mainly because they play against the Seattle Seahawks. The, the Seattle Seahawks in the last three weeks, I'm just going to go ahead and read some stats. The Indianapolis Colts in week one had 90 rushing yards and 108 receiving yards amongst running backs. The Tennessee Titans in week two, 182 on the ground, three touchdowns, and even Derrick Henry had himself 55 receiving yards. Minnesota this last week with Alexander Madison, uh, you know, Amir Abdullah, you know, whatever the heck it was the backfield there. We end up seeing 136 rushing yards and 59 receiving yards. There is so much potential for points. And I think a team like the 49ers that want to run the ball, regardless of who's the running back, is going to find success. I know Trey Sermon didn't look good against the Green Bay Packers. Ended up getting himself a touchdown, dropped a couple passes here and there. I uh, wasn't relied upon to be a you know third down back. They had Kyle Juszczyk there, uh, pass blocking, and of course, catching an almost game-winning touchdown. Regardless, I think whoever the starting running back is this upcoming week has a lot of value. Uh, but I do think they're, they might be splitting. We're just going to have to wait and see based on the practice reports. Rankings are subject to change. We'll see you on Sunday morning for updated rankings. Zach Moss is our number 24 and the last of our RB2 conversation. Zach Moss in the last two weeks, again, has only played the last two weeks. Missed week one was a surprise and active. Zach Moss has scored three touchdowns in the last two games, and now they play against the Houston Texans. It is going to be garbage time free points, and that's purely what it's going to be. Like, when I went and I looked at Devin Singletary and when he stopped playing this last week against Washington, there was 11 minutes and 40 seconds left in the fourth quarter, and he left the game. And he didn't get another touch for the rest of the game. You want to know why? Because it was Zach Moss time. Where he ready to get himself some rushing attempts, some receiving yards. Obviously, early in that game, had himself a receiving touchdown. Three catches, 31 yards, and a receiving touchdown. Great numbers. Overall, I think Zach Moss benefits from the fact that he gets early involvement and is their garbage time guy. It's absolutely fantastic. Moving on to the RB3 conversation. Unfortunately, many of you have been wondering, where is Saquon Barkley, Andrew? He's coming off an 18.4 fantasy week. He's coming off of 51 rushing yards on 16 carries, 6 catches, and 43 yards. It looks like Saquon of old. You know what? I'm not going to argue with that. I talked about him. He was on my thumbnail last week. Go and trade for Saquon. He is eventually going to get back to being Saquon. We saw 6, 7, 8, 12-yard runs this last week, but we also saw a couple which was negative 3, negative 2, 1 yard, no gain, because that's his offensive line. And as the weeks progress, we're going to see Saquon get more and more healthy, get more and more comfortable within this offense. But the issue that I have this upcoming week that currently plagues me is that he plays against New Orleans, guys. I can't, I mean, I just, I have a hard time playing him against the New Orleans Saints. I, I truly do. You know, the New Orleans Saints thus far this season have only given up 2.54 yards per carry on average that in itself is extremely difficult to look at of course this last week they brutalized the backfield 
of the uh, the New England Patriots. I mean, Damian Harris did nothing. They took, you know, James White and pretty much broke his hip. I don't know what they did to him. Brandon Bolden had the most productivity out of that backfield. He is a special teams player, guys. He had the most productivity out of the backfield for New England. Outside of week two, which, again, the entire Saints organization was in shambles. Week one, I mean, you saw what they were able to do against uh, Aaron Jones in that entire Packers offense. I think Saquon's a fantastic running back. I think going forward, guys, he's got a lot of potential. He really does. He's going to get back to being Saquon. But it's a tough matchup. We put him at 25 because I respect him enough to think, you know what, there is a chance that Saquon breaks out an 80-yard run. I've seen it in the past. He could do it. So that's why I had I have him ahead of a lot of these other options. But again, just keep in mind, the matchup is very tough this upcoming week, regardless of his specific talent. We have Daryl Henderson going into our number 26 spot. Now, I have Daryl Henderson here because... You know, from what we've heard from Sean McVay, he is very hopeful that Daryl Henderson can play this upcoming week. And if that's going to be the case, you may be thinking, Andrew, why don't you have Daryl Henderson in like the top 10, top 15? You know, hasn't he scored 15 or 16 points each of the first two weeks of his respective season? Yes, that is the actual truth. And in fact, was a fantastic running back in those contests because he found the end zone. But my only issue at this current moment in time is if, in fact, Daryl Henderson returns. And we're going to see a split backfield because we just saw Sony Michel get himself 20 carries on the ground and three receptions on four total targets. 9.4 fantasy points against a Tampa Bay run-stopping defense at that. I think there's a potential in which they start splitting snaps and regardless of a very advantageous matchup against the Arizona Cardinals, which of course, a couple weeks back against Minnesota, Dalvin Cook, 131 on the ground. Of course, J-Rob, 88 on the ground, a touchdown, six catches for 46. There's a lot of potential here, but if they start splitting snaps... I know Daryl could probably lead the pack, but there's always a potential of him losing overall upside. Cordero Patterson is our number 27. I'm going to put respect on the man's name. Cordero Patterson is the number 10 overall running back in fantasy half PPR. Can you guys imagine that? He's the number 10 overall running back. In the last two weeks, he's had 14 targets leading to 11 receptions for 140 receiving yards and one receiving touchdown. In the last two weeks, unbelievable numbers. I mean, just to put it in perspective, 14 targets in the last two weeks. Calvin Ridley's only had 15 targets in the last two weeks. I mean, Matt Ryan, his arm is done. He's washed. He literally is only throwing the ball pretty close to the line of scrimmage. And he's you know, relatively accurate there. Everywhere else, not so much. He doesn't really have much time in the pocket. His offensive line sucks. They play against the Washington football team. Speaking of offensive line sucking and a defense that wants to kind of prove themselves once again, we, we got a, you know, a couple hitters on that defense in terms of what they're sending in terms of pass rush. And pressure, Cordero Patterson is going to benefit from the fact that he's going to get himself rushes on the ground, potentially steal a touchdown, but of course, a lot of targets going in his direction. 14 in the last two weeks, leading to 11 receptions, 140 yards. Sheesh, it's good numbers. Moving on. We have Javante Williams as our number 28. I think Javante Williams getting himself about 15 touches per game is great. In comparison to other running backs, I think they would be a little bit more efficient than him. He's only averaged about 3.5 yards per carry. Again, it is an offensive thing. It is a schematic thing. A lot of garbage time work for him. But I think they have an advantage this upcoming week against the Baltimore Ravens. You play in Denver, you know, it's going to be hard to travel to Denver and win. And I think as of this current moment of time, this is a team that wants to continuously run the ball, continue to find success there. As long as Javante Williams is getting more and more upside in terms of PPR work. Four targets, three catches, 33 receiving yards. Obviously more than, uh, respectively, Melvin Gordon saw. Melvin Gordon only had, what, one catch for 21? Um, as long as those numbers continue to progress in the right direction, Javante Williams continues to carve himself out a lot of value. We have Jamal Williams, another running back that has been insane. I think he's the number 15 back in fantasy, if I'm not mistaken. But regardless of this, he's coming off a week in which he had 13.7 fantasy points, 42 rushing yards, a rushing touchdown. What we've seen... Uh, which has been unfortunate, but it is the reality of the situation considering DeAndre Swift is the more uh, talented receiving back on the team. Javante Williams has only had five catches in the last two weeks. That has obviously decreased his overall upside because the rushing attempts are going to be there. Rushing touchdowns are obviously based on whether or not they're able to get down there or whether or not DeAndre Swift gets the opportunity. But either way, they play against Chicago. Chicago is a very stable matchup, and I think one that they can find a lot of success in. That's why we have Jamal Williams here at 29. Leonard Fournette, you know, the Tampa Bay running backs, you know, they don't even exist. To be honest, if they were invisible outside of, of course, guys in the passing game, I wouldn't be surprised. They don't run the ball. They don't find much effectiveness in running the ball. I mean, Leonard Fournette, they're, they're like, oh, Leonard's going to be the official starter this week. Leonard was has been the starter. Like, what are we talking about? He's been the starter since like week 15 of last year. I mean, 
some of the reports that come out of Tampa Bay just piss me off because, to be honest, Bruce Arians is a liar. He doesn't want to give us good information. And to be honest, he doesn't want to run the ball. Four carries for eight yards. That is horrible. I mean, that is not great at all. But I will tell you this. They play against New England. And to be honest, this should be a blowout. Tampa Bay should manhandle Mac Jones and whatever semblance of an offense that team has. And if and when they do, Tom Brady's going to score. And if and when they do, they're going to have to run the ball in the second half. Leonard Fournette is a good running back. Give him opportunity, he'll prove it. And I think this week, he'll hopefully find the end zone and maybe not get a, you know, a TB12 sneak as he's you know so good at doing. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on to Miles Gaskin as our number 31. I think Gaskin's a fantastic running back. But the issue as of this current moment in time is that he is kind of facing a little bit of that Jordan Howard-esque uh, beginning that he saw last year. Malcolm Brown comes in and vultures touchdowns. And is it disgusting? Yes. Does it pain for me to see it? Absolutely. But he has a great match of this upcoming week against Indianapolis. Carson in week one, 91 rushing yards against them. Week two, the LA Rams backfield went for 99 rushing yards and a rushing touchdown. Week three, Derrick Henry, 113 rushing yards. This team has given up 90 minimum rushing yards to a singular running back in the last three weeks. Great numbers. We will take it. But is Miles Gaskin going to be able to produce those numbers? The offensive line looks, yeah. Jacoby Brissett has looked good. I mean, th- their offense, you know, was churning. They almost beat the Raiders. But with this all said, as long as he's getting PPR work and the, you know, valuable attempts on the ground, eventually he'll find the end zone and he'll be valuable. Just as of right now, not as much upside as we potentially would have projected earlier in the season. Mike Davis is our number 32. He is the second Atlanta Falcons running back I'm mentioning, mainly because Mike Davis, he doesn't get as much PPR game, doesn't have as much upside in the PPR game, but regardless of that, catches the ball. Last week, four catches, four rece- I mean, four total targets, four receptions, 20 receiving yards. Now, the running backs against Washington have done something very similar to one another in terms of yardage. Week one, Eckler, 57 and one touchdown. Barkley, week two, 57, zero touchdowns. Zach Moss, week three, 60 yards and a touchdown. I expect Mike Davis to put up very similar numbers because he's coming off of a week in which he had 12 carries for 50 yards on the ground. So maybe he gets himself 55 rushing yards, and if he can score a touchdown, great. If he can't, can get himself four catches for 20 yards again and nine-point running back, and that's why we have him at number 32. Moving on to number 33, Devin Singletary. I think I mentioned it before in regards to Zach Moss and his potential. The game script will determine whether or not Devin Singletary is on the field. And Devin Singletary is a guy that, if in fact his offense needs to score points, is on the field. But this upcoming week, he probably won't need to be on the field as they play against the Houston Texans. Maybe if he's going to score early in the game, that's great. But I mentioned it with Zach Moss. The last time Devin Singletary touched the ball in that game against the Washington football team on Sunday was 11 minutes and 8 seconds left in the fourth quarter. Again, there's a lot of garbage time to be had in a contest like that. And I think Zach Moss cleans it up, which renders Devin Singletary as a lesser overall play. Tony Pollard is our number 34. Coming off in another incredible week, 11 carries, 60 yards, only one target for one catch in five yards. Seven fantasy points. We'll take it. Absolutely take it. As of this current moment in time, playing against Carolina, I do believe that the Dallas Cowboys defense is going to be able to run through them regardless. But I wanted to go ahead and express a specific observation I had. When I went back and I watched last night's game just to kind of understand just how good Dallas's offensive line was and what kind of schemes they were running, um, Pollard and Zeke kind of rotated in a specific manner that is something that may be a pattern for them. Specifically, in uh, drive number one for the Dallas Cowboys, pretty much in terms of touches for running backs, it was all Zeke. Pollard did not touch the ball once in that drive. In the second drive, they both split. In the third drive, it was all Pollard. In the fourth drive, it was both of them. So we get Zeke, both, Pollard, both. And then we have Zeke again. There's a little bit of a pattern here, but what I did end up realizing over time was that Zeke, late in the game, was the only running back touching the ball, mainly because he's the better pass blocking back. He's going to be in the game more, which obviously opens him up for more receiving work. And in terms of who they trust more potentially down on the goal line, even though I do think Pollard is capable of it, they want to put their battering ram down there and they want him to continue to run the ball. Either way, Pollard is continuing to carve out himself a role. The touchdown upside is always there. PPR upside is certainly going to be there, but not as much as potentially Zeke's going forward. Damian Harris is a number 35. No respect to Damian Harris, but you play against Tampa Bay. You're coming off a week in which he had six carries for 14 yards against New Orleans. I think New Orleans and Tampa Bay, uh, Tampa Bay is 
Defense technically will give up more points on the ground to opposing running backs in comparison to New Orleans. But with that said, I don't trust this backfield. I don't trust this offense. And I don't trust that Damian Harris is going to get the PPR work in if and when, in fact, this team is getting blown out by Tampa Bay, which leads me to having him as a lower overall threat here. But again, could score if lucky. We move on to Naeem Hines, our final option. Carson Wentz looked like a statue out there. He can't move. He's not mobile. His ankles hurt. But he looks to the check down. Six targets, five receptions, 54 receiving yards, and yoink the rushing touchdown. It's a very advantageous matchup against the Miami Dolphins. Maybe if, in fact, um, you know, Naeem Hines gets more work. Earlier this morning, Marlon Mack has requested that he's going to seek out a trade. The organization granted him that. And I think Naeem Hines going forward, a great option. Either way, those are my rankings for the running back position for week four of the 2021 fantasy football season. Guys, if you like today's video, smash that like button. Really do appreciate it. Subscribe to the channel. I make content like this every single day, every single week. So if, in fact, you're looking for this kind of stuff to help you win a 2021 fantasy football championship, because that is every single one of our goals this year, well, this is the channel to do it. Thank you, guys. And until tomorrow, we'll talk about the wide receiver position. I'll see you. Peace. Peace.